Alright guys, I finally checked out Solo and I have to say, no wonder this thing failed. I mean, look at it. It's like six pages long, all the sounds are terrible. Listen to this. This is the worst thing ever. Wait, Solo was a movie? Oh, crap. Alright, let's start over. Alright, I'm just kidding. No, look, Solo was an okay movie. Not great, but definitely not as bad as I was expecting it would be. Turns out the guy who wrote both Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark knows how to competently structure a plot. Maybe when you were writing the final chapter in the saga of one of the most beloved pop culture icons of all time, you should have got the guy who wrote two-thirds of that character's original arc. And not the guy who wrote the Brothers Bloom. It also turns out that when you fire the geniuses behind the greatest animated program of all time, Say what? You can always depend on good old Richie Cunningham to limp your film over the finish line with slightly above mediocre results. This bald bastard really knows how to put in that B-plus effort, I tell you what. Now, if Solo was a normal movie, there really wouldn't be much to talk about. It's a slightly above average action movie with a few neat set pieces and Woody Harrelson. But obviously Solo is more than just another forgettable popcorn distraction. It's a Star Wars movie, and that's a label which carries a significant amount of weight. More importantly, it's the first Star Wars movie to actually lose money. Solo bombed so bad that King Disney himself said it was too much, too fast, and that we can expect some slowdown. The movie's terrible performance has put the entire future of the Star Wars cinematic universe into question. And though Kathleen Kennedy has somehow held onto her job like a drunken ship captain clinging to the mast, I have a suspicion that Ryan Johnson's much-anticipated Star Wars trilogy might be on hold for a while. So here's the real question. Why did Solo bomb? It's something I've thought about for a while, and I honestly think there's only one answer. Russian bots. No, but <laughs> no. What I really think is that Disney didn't stop to consider some of the problems inherent to a Star Wars cinematic universe, and that George Lucas got one hell of a deal stealing four billion Disney dollars from the cryogenically frozen hands of Walt himself. We're thrilled that George has entrusted the future of his extraordinary legacy to the Walt Disney Company. For me, I look at it as uh, uh, I'm investing in Disney because that's my retirement fund. Break bread with the enemy, no matter how many cats are Because sure, on paper, a Star Wars cinematic universe sounds like a great idea. That Marvel cinematic universe is like a glowing portal to the money dimension, and everybody loves Star Wars. How could you possibly screw it up? But as I've talked about before, Star Wars and Marvel are not the same thing. And the cinematic universe concept honestly works much better with comic book heroes than it does with 40-year-old films featuring a locked-in continuity. See, comic books don't really care all that much about maintaining a fixed timeline. For example, originally Mr. Fantastic fought in World War II. If that was true now, he'd be like 100 years old. So obviously they just changed his origin story. Also, he originally fell in love with Sue Storm when he was 20 and she was 13. <laughs> and they changed that because Jesus f Christ, Mr. Fantastic, robbing the cradle with his big old stretchy arms, you pervert. Point is, nobody actually cares about comic continuity because it's changing constantly. At any point, the writers can just have Superboy Prime punch reality really hard, altering the timeline and making it so Batman doesn't look like your grandpa. And let's be clear, that's exactly what's happening with this Infinity War thing. The remaining Avengers are going to use the Pretty Pretty Princess gems to create a new alternate timeline where they no longer have to pay Robert Downey Jr. $50 million every time they make a movie. But Star Wars has a set timeline, and you can't really mess around with it. It's not like you can just create a new universe where Luke Skywalker is a sassy black woman solving space mysteries. If you want to tell a story in the Star Wars universe, you have to work within the established canon, or at least what parts of it you haven't thrown out. And therein lies the problem. Because as much as Disney wants to use established characters to draw in the audience, they really have limited room to play around with those characters. Like, if I make a Batman movie, I can just invent a new Batman universe and nobody will care. Fuck Batman. But if I make an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, I have to place it somewhere on the existing Star Wars timeline, probably between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope. But what story can you tell there that has any weight? Sure, you could do another battle between him and Darth Vader, but what would be the point? It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! 
We already know how both of their character arcs begin and end, whereas with something like Infinity War, we have no idea what's going to happen. Everybody died! They killed off Black Panther! How do <laughs> we didn't expect that! So adding more to the story of Obi-Wan or Darth Vader really isn't that exciting. It would just be a pointless side story with nothing at stake. See, I'd argue that continuing to add needless backstory to characters and worlds we already know and love rarely makes those things better. And in many cases, an overabundance of exposition actually makes them worse. Which brings me to my main point. Now what I see as the biggest problem with Solo is the lighting. I can't tell what's going on in half the si Why is it so dark? Just turn on the lights. Okay, but seriously, what I see as the biggest problem with Solo is a lack of respect for the importance of mystery. Something I would consider one of the most important aspects of a good story. Now I'm a man who loves mystery. I mean, not all mysteries. Like, uh, before we start making out, I want to know what kind of equipment you're packing. Not that I'm even against penises, I just need some mental preparation time, whatever. See, what I think made the original Star Wars movie so great is that it didn't feel the need to explain everything. With many aspects of the universe only touched on for a brief moment. What is a Jedi Knight? Who is Darth Vader? Is that Satan? Does Satan hang out in a space bar? Why? These questions added depth to the Star Wars universe, even if they weren't immediately explained. Because trust me, Lucas had no goddamn idea what a Clone War was when he wrote A New Hope. You fought in the Clone Wars? It was just a neat line that gave us the sense that there was more to this universe than we were being shown. Now the sequels would eventually answer many of these questions. Which is good. The audience wanted to know who Darth Vader was, they wanted to know what the Jedi were all about, etc. These were important thematic questions which had actual bearing on the story. But I'd argue that the reverse was true of the prequels, which answered many questions that didn't really need answering. Who built C-3PO? What was Boba Fett like as a child? And of course, the most ruined mystery of all, what is the Force? Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. They live inside me. Sure, the rise and fall of Anakin Skywalker was a story many people were interested in, but I honestly liked the feeling of not knowing what a Clone War was, having to imagine what caused Anakin to turn against his master Obi-Wan. And I really liked the narrative device of being dropped straight into episode 4 of some epic saga. It reminds me of the story of the Trojan War. Though we still have the Iliad and the Odyssey, the other parts of that story have been lost to time. I guess some moron burned the sacred texts. The sacred Jedi texts! Ooh. But again, I understand that people wanted an Anakin Skywalker trilogy, and I'm honestly okay with that concept. Even if what we eventually got was worse than any of us could have ever imagined. But the mysteries of Anakin's rise and fall were actually intriguing, whereas the story of how Han Solo met Chewbacca is not. Okay, now here's the part where I talk about anime, sorry, let's just get it over with. Alright, so there's this anime called Evangelion. It's one of my favorite things in this world. This is my Evangelion wallet, this is my Evangelion Mighty Max playset, and this is my Evangelion popcorn bucket. I don't know why anybody would put popcorn in this, but hey, Japanese people are crazy, what are you gonna do? Now I'll try to avoid spoilers, but Evangelion is basically about a bunch of giant monsters who want to make love to a fat alien Jesus and end all life on Earth. The only thing that can defeat them are these giant robots, and the only people who can pilot the robots are Japanese teenagers who get progressively mind-raped across 26 episodes in a two-part movie. Now probably the most interesting part of the show are the countless mysteries surrounding these weird-ass robots and the children chosen to pilot them. What do the monsters really want? Who is this weird albino chick? Why do we keep putting emotionally crippled kids inside the robots? Why don't you pilot the goddamn robot, Dad? This is sick what you're doing. Point is, all of these questions are very interesting, and as the show goes on, you do get some of the answers. However, once you reach the final two episodes, everything goes off the rails. There's no more robots, there's no more giant space monsters, it's just two half-hour installments of a sad kid sitting in a folding chair, a bunch of nonsense about the true nature of humanity, and then the whole thing ends with a bunch of people standing in a circle clapping. What is this? This doesn't make any sense. Did we win? Did we destroy the space monsters? Why are we clapping? What did we do? So after you watch those two weird ass episodes, you find out that there's a movie that supposedly wraps everything up. So you watch the movie and at the end of it, you go, what the f was that? Everybody was just glowing and bleeding and screaming. <laughs> this show actually makes less sense now. What the hell is going on? Now, a lot of people watch Evangelion and they get pissed. I get it. They want more answers than the show is willing to give them. A lot of people had the same reaction to Lost, though I'd argue J.J. Abrams avoided giving answers because even he didn't know what the hell was going on. Luckily, he learned his lesson, stopped inventing random plot threads with absolutely no clue where they were going, right? You jackass. 
But here's the thing, as much as I and many others wanted to know all the secrets of Evangelion, the truth is that they didn't really matter. Because the show was never really about giant robots fighting evil aliens, nor was it about turning all of humanity into a giant bleeding space orb. Ah, oh, that's a spoiler. Whatever. It, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's not gonna matter. It was the story of a young man exposed to the most raw and horrible depths of human emotion, and whether in the infinite ocean of psychological darkness he finds something worth believing in. So while at first it was frustrating to not have all my questions answered, once I accepted it, my appreciation for the show actually grew. I was able to focus on the real themes without the distraction of unnecessary exposition. In the same way, I argue that the original trilogy was never about X-Wings or TIE Fighters or lightsaber battles. Those movies were about a young boy who went looking for his destiny, who bore witness to the sins of his father and had to decide whether or not to go down the same path. They were also about a ruthless, opportunistic smuggler who learned to overcome his selfishness and fight for a greater good, who abandoned the obvious thematic weight of a name like Solo. Well, take care of yourself, Han. But I guess that's what you're best at, isn't it? And instead allowed himself to have friends, allowed himself to love. What I'm trying to say is I don't give a shit about where Han Solo got his dice, or his blaster, or the Millennium Falcon. I don't care how he met Chewbacca, I don't care how he met Lando, and I don't care what a Kessel Run is. I definitely don't need to know why his name is Han Solo. I just assumed it was a random space name which happened to have a relevant English definition. Who are your people? I don't have people. I'm alone. Solo. I'm alone. Solo. I'm alone. I'm alone. Solo. I'm alone. I'm on Solo. So really, it's not that Solo is a bad movie. It's that what it offers is only of interest to the most diehard fans. The ones who consume endless YouTube videos about kyber crystals and whatever else. And I'm not knocking those fans, because I've done plenty of hours of research on my favorite robot show. But none of what I learned from the Japanese-only PSP side story is good fodder for a movie. And neither is anything in Solo. Real quick, let me give you a quote. This is Roger Ebert talking about the terrible sequel to Stanley Kubrick's 2001. I felt that the poetry of 2001 was precisely in its mystery, and that to explain everything was to ruin everything, like the little boy who cut open his drum to see what made it bang. That's the real point. Learning that Han Solo got friendzoned by some chick who wanted to hop on Darth Maul's D-Train is not interesting enough to be worth taking away the mystique of Han Solo's character. In the same way, the Alien franchise isn't made better by learning that the creature is the final byproduct of a space squid raping a god and a gay android tinkering with the DNA of their monster baby. A bit of mystery is a wonderful thing, and filmmakers need to ask themselves whether solving those mysteries is truly going to make for a great new story I am your father. or just damage the stories we already love. The DeLoreans are a microscopic life form. So, did Solo truly kill the Star Wars cinematic universe? In a way, yes. It showed Disney that their plan to force out these turds at such a rapid pace was just giving them hemorrhoids. So they're slowing down. Hopefully Solo showed them that they can't rely on nostalgic characters alone to bring in an audience. And maybe that'll lead to more original films like Rogue One, which took a creative risk and told a story with all new characters. That seems to be what they're doing with The Mandalorian, a TV show about a new character who hopefully isn't Boba Fett's brother or something stupid like that. Do you remember Boba Fett? It's going to take some serious work to undo the damage of The Last Jedi, but I'm cautiously optimistic. This shakeup sounds like a good thing, and maybe it really could save Star Wars. But first, they need to bring Luke Skywalker back from the dead and let him pilot an X-Wing right through Kylo Ren's frickin' skull, man. Just like, boom, headshot, you know? Oh, and you gotta bring back Ewoks, man. Everybody loves Ewoks. Episode 9, Revenge of the Ewoks. We're gonna save this Star Wars cinematic universe, baby. Best movie ever. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching my video. Right now I'm running a Kickstarter for a card game I created. It's called Enemy Weapon. If you like my sense of humor, you're gonna love this game. It's hilarious. There's a link in the description. Please check it out. I think you're gonna love it. Don't forget to like and subscribe or whatever the heck else. And of course, may the force be with you.